कैन यू सी द स्लाइड डियर स्टूडेंट्स यस सर ओके नाउ वी स्टार्ट सो मैनेजमेंट ऑफ सोयल ऑर्गेनिक मैटर नाउ वी आर गोइंग टू कवर द एस्पेक्ट लाइक फैक्टर अफेक्टिंग ऑर्गेनिक मैटर इन सोयल हियर व्हाट आर द इंपॉर्टेंट फैक्टर्स दैट अफेक्ट्स द लेवल्स ऑफ ऑर्गेनिक मैटर मींस व्हाई ऑर्गेनिक मैटर इज मोर इन वन काइंड ऑफ सोयल देन other kind of soil so we will see all those factor that affect and it is important to understand the factors or reason behind uh, the richness of organic matter or poorness of organic matter in a soil if we know the factors or reasons then we can correct them so that we maintain the optimum level of organic matter then we will see factors affecting the decomposition of organic matter just now we have seen organic matter under two settings one is aerobic condition other is anaerobic and anaerobic conditions so we will see what are the factors that affect its rate rate of decomposition just now you have seen that under water load condition the rate of decomposition was slow but under aerobic condition means where you get good moisture ideal moisture and ideal level of oxygen then you get faster decomposition if oxygen was not there water was there then the rate of decomposition was slow that means the oxygen supply and water supply in soil will affect the rate of decomposition the temperature will affect the rate of decomposition the residue quality or organic matter quality will also affect its rate of decomposition so we are going to see all those factors then or the third topic will be organic supplements and soil pollution in the last lecture i have shown you the status of soil pollution what are the soil pollu pollutants where from they come what they do to the plant what they do to the soil what harm they do to the human beings we discussed all monitoring of them is essential and then comes the remediation in remediation organic supplements can be added to overcome or to reduce the soil pollution or to reduce the ill effect of soil pollution so we will see how organic matter or organic matter supplements can reduce the soil pollution then what would be the ideal levels of soil organic matter or soil carbon at which you get the best results means it is good for the environment it is good for the soil as well as good for the crops so what are the optimum levels of soil yesterday i have shown you that soils which have more than 30% organic matter are organic soils soils which have less than 30% organic matter are inorganic soils or mineral soils but in general our cultivated soils they do not contain 10% 15% or 30% organic matter they normally contains 1% less than 1% 2% if they are in temperate region region they can have 3 to 4% so not more than this that but what are the ideal level is, is it 1% is it 2% 5% we will see what are the optimum levels of soil organic carbon of course they will vary with the climate in one climate a particular range of organic matter may be ideal under another kind of climate or or environment you will have another optimum level of carbon practices now we will see that under most of the conditions the soil organic carbon is declining particularly due to global warming and several other factors the soil organic carbon in general or organic matter is declining so we must increase it and how we can increase it we will see it. so all these aspects we are going to discuss in this lecture the first one is factors affecting soil organic matter levels so in general you will see that organic matter in coarse textured soils less than 1% less than 1% in most of the coarse textured soil means sandy soils to 5% organic matter in some soils can be up to 5% in fertile prairie grassland soils under these condition so you can see range of organic matter may be from less than 1% up to 5% or more than that 1% or less than 1% under coarse textured soils in sandy soils and more than 5% in prairie grassland soil so you can see this range is very large if you convert it into numerical value it will come very large variation the amount of 
uh, amount is influenced by the five soil forming factors. What are the factors that will affect the quantity of why you have more carbon, more organic matter in grassland soil, and why you have less organic matter in coarse texture soils? What are the reasons? So, in general, you can subscribe five reasons. And these are actually factors of soil formation. You can see five soil forming factors. So, climate, vegetation, topography, period material, and age. So, here you can see these processes will affect the organic matter content. So, this is very general. Uh, these are very general uh, factors, but you can divide them in several ways. You can uh, say some internal inherent factors, external factors. There are many ways to divide them, but most important are climatic factors. You see, climatic factors are most important in organic matter. Climatic factors means your water, moisture, uh, air, temperature, uh, and so on. And vegetation, vegetation factors means what kind of vegetation is there? Is it permanent forest? Is it permanent grassland? Is, is, is it grazing land? Is it uh, forest land? Is it cultivated land? Is this, what kind, is it virgin land? What kind of vegetation is there? It also affects. And sometimes grassland will have more organic matter than forest land. Similarly, topography. Topography of the place also affects the organic matter content, parent material parent material and age. So these are the factors that affect. For details, uh, you can see uh, nature and properties of soil, good book. I will send you today or tomorrow. Now, general points with uh, regard to uh, soil organic matter in virgin soils. Suppose they are virgin soil. Now you see, just you first you see the picture on the right side. Picture on the right side, one is grassland soil. So in grassland soil, you can see the root growth is very high. The root growth is very high and roots are going very deep, very deep. And in this case, you can see if you, the, the contribution of roots will be high in organic matter, soil organic matter. And as I told you, they contain more lignin. The decomposition rate of uh, um, roots is very, very slow. So accumulation of organic matter will be very high. And also you can see some leaves some leaves will come to the ground and they will die, they will decompose and some particulate organic matter will come, carbon will come into the soil. And also you see uh, if they are in temperate kind of climate, temperate kind of climate, then decomposition rate will be slow. So you can see here the accumulation of organic matter is more in soil and this is your forest soil. In forest soil, you will have some vegetation. Of course, vegetation is there but you will have trees. So trees take very less space in the soil and they go very deep. So in the top soil, you can say, you won't have much organic matter accumulation as in case of uh, grasslands. So what are general points about soil organic matter in virgin soils where there is no cultivation? So soils formed in grasslands have greater humus than forest vegetation, number one. Number two, soil organic matter increases with increasing precipitation. Means if you increase, uh, just cons uh, consider only one factor. Do not consider temperature. Just if you consider just precipitation, soil organic matter increases with increasing precipitation. Similarly, if you just take temperature as a factor, no interaction with other factors, then organic matter decreases with increasing temperature. As you increase the temperature, organic matter will um, decrease because of rate of decomposition will increase. So this is just we are talking independently. But when we find the interaction of precipitation and temperature, the scene scenario will be different. We will discuss it. Next statement is fine textured soils, that is clay soil, have higher soil organic matter than coarse textured soils. Now I want to ask you the reason. Why the fine textured soils have higher soil organic matter than coarse textured soils? Under identical conditions, identical climatic conditions, where you have same temperature, same rainfall, but you have two kinds of soil. One is sandy soil, other is clay soil. 
definitely your clay soil will have more organic matter than the sandy soil. What are the reasons? This is question to you. Sir, because of the texture. Yeah, because you have sandy soil, their textures are different. But how this texture will affect the organic matter? No texture, you can say, is structure. Texture is okay. It has sand, uh, sand, more sand, and this uh, clay soil have more clay. So that is texture. If you speak, Sir, high water capacity. Huh? High water holding capacity. Yeah, that is important. That is important. Uh, you can relate it, but you need to relate it to organic. How this high water content will increase the organic matter in soil? Just think over it. You, you are coming to the point. So naturally, under similar conditions, this clay soil will have more water storage capacity. More water means compared to sandy soil, it will have partly anaerobic conditions or more aerobic. This clay soil may be more an anaerobic than the sandy soil. And sandy soil also have very large pores. So it will have more aeration, uh, more aeration than uh, clay soil under identical conditions. Therefore, decomposition rate of organic matter will be slow. Second point is that in clay soil, you have sufficient moisture. But in that soil, sandy soil, you may have deficiency of moisture. Therefore, plant growth will be higher, will be more under clay soil compared to sandy soil. And once the plant growth is more, that means your root growth will be more. Therefore, accumulation of organic matter, contribution by the plant for towards organic matter in soil will be more in clay soil than in sandy soil. So th these are few reasons that you have um, more organic matter in fine texture soil than sandy. We'll see in detail. Poorly drained soils, we, we have seen uh, water load condition of rice. Poorly drained soils have higher soil organic matter than well drained soil. This fact is known to you. And similarly, lowland soils. Lowland soils means water load soils have higher soil organic matter than upland topographic position. So these are some general points related to soil organic matter. Now, we can categorize these factors that affect the soil organic matter level in soil into two environmental factors like temperature, moisture, natural vegetation, soil texture, and drainage. And other is management factors. So we can have two factors that affects the soil organic matter levels. So let us see the temperature, how temperature will affect the organic matter. Respiration loss of soil carbon takes place at increasing rates as soil temperature increases. So this is one statement. If your uh, temperature increases, then respiration loss or decomposition rate will be more. Means your microbial activity will, will be high. Temperature response is greater. You see, temperature response is greater for respiration of Levi soil organic carbon than for carbon in the resistant humus fraction. So microbial activity will be more on the Levi soil carbon under high temperature. However, humus will not be affected. Next is temperature response interact with soil moisture. Being small when water is limited. Means if water is limited, temperature cannot increase the decomposition rate. Temperature alone cannot increase the decomposition rate. And also declining when soils are so wet that oxygen becomes limiting to the process. So if there is no water in the soil, temperature will not work. How You can go on increasing. And similarly, if there is a lot of water in the soil, more water in the soil, then also due to deficiency of oxygen, this temperature will remain, remain not much effective. So when this temperature will remain effective, more effective, this high temperature at good moisture condition 
neither too short and neither too high. So th that is the point. So temperature interact with moisture percent of water availability. Another issue is that these days global warming is getting uh, known to people and I need not to explain what is global warming to you people because I assume that you understand. It. So globally soil contains about uh, 1500 PG. PG, uh, I, 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 is it petagram or picogram? But I don't know dear students this P, PG, but it is some unit of weight. So 1500 PG, one PG is equal to one gigaton is equal to 10 to the power 15 gram. So you can see 1500 PG is your uh, organic carbon in the world. So world uh, soils, or you can say world soil contain uh, 1500 PG of organic carbon, and which is three times the amount of carbon in vegetation, and twice, two times the amount in the atmosphere. So you can see soil is very large reserve of organic matter on global basis. Soil carbon pools are smaller now than they were before human intervention. So if you go 5,000, 10,000 years before, compared to that period, now the soil carbon pool has declined significantly. Historically, soils have lost about 40 to 90 PG 40 to 90 PG carbon globally through cultivation and disturbance. So human being has already depleted the soil organic carbon from their activities to the tune of 40 to 90 PG globally. So these are the losses of carbon. So this global warming, you can see increasing, what it is doing global warming, increasing decomposition rate under global warming. A small scale laboratory, laboratory and field experiment and modeling studies suggest that climate change is likely to induce soil carbon loss. So this global warming in one line, we can say that it is uh, decreasing the soil organic carbon. Global uh, warming is a factor that, that declines the organic carbon. So just now you have seen the role of temperature and now see the moisture. Moisture, temperature, and air or oxygen. They actually work together. Their interaction is very, very important. So now you see moisture under comparable conditions. Soil organic carbon and nitrogen increase as effective moisture become greater. So in soil, you will have more soil organic carbon more nitrogen if you increase the water content. Higher the water content, more are the levels of soil organic carbon and nitrogen, mainly because of slowdown in decomposition, decomposition process. So water entry in soil slows down the decomposition. Therefore, you will get higher levels of soil organic carbon as well as nitrogen in those soils. And also it is important, I want to tell you that in waterlogged soil, you will not have any leaching losses of nitrate. Most of the time, a student considered that in water locked soil, a lot of leaching of water can happen because water is there in the soil, so more leaching of water will be there. No doubt, leaching will increase. Leaching of water will increase, particularly when your water table is, is very deep or very low. But uh, because under water low condition, there is shortage of oxygen. So there will not be formation of nitrate. In those soils, the nitrates will not be formed because nitrification cannot happen. Because most of the soil is reduced, only top soil, uh, say one millimeter or two millimeter depth is oxidized. So in that soil, very small quantity of nitrate will be formed. And that quantity can be taken up by plant. So not much nitrate is available for leaching under water load conditions. So you can remember that under water load condition, there is very little leaching of nitrate. Volatilization will be there. Volatilization losses will be there. Denitrification losses will be there. But nitrate leaching will be very, very insignificant. 
now you see moisture continues. Uh, this is on x axis, you have temperature 0, 5, 10, 15, 20, and so on. Under both cases, both cases you have the same temperature range, but one case is your aerobic. On the left picture, left side picture is for aerobic condition, and right side picture is for uh, anaerobic condition, anaerobic condition. And seeing the effect of water, because aerobic condition means uh, you have uh, sufficient oxygen and uh, and sufficient water also, aerobic condition means it is ideal condition for crop growth. But on the right side, it is water low condition, it is anaerobic condition. So here your oxygen is limited. In one case, uh, oxygen, sufficient oxygen and water is there. In another case, water is in excess and your uh, water is in excess and your oxygen is deficient. So what happens in this case, the shaded areas, you can see this shaded area and this shaded area, organic matter accumulation under aerobic, left side and aerobic soils, right side. Higher soil organic matter accumulation in cool climates, especially in water log anaerobic soils. So here under cool climate, under lower temperature range, if you have anaerobic condition, the accumulation of organic matter in soil is more compared to aerobic condition. Anaerobic uh, accumulation of organic matter is greater at most temperature and continues at higher temperature than aerobic condition. So it is interesting fact and relation of moisture to organic matter levels. Influence of natural vegetation. So climate and vegetation usually act together to influence the soil organic matter. Vegetation is also determined by the climate. Climate means your temperature, water, relative humidity, sunshine, light, etc. So climate and vegetation usually act together to influence the soil organic matter. Greater plant productivity happen by a well-watered environment leads to greater addition to the pool of soil organic matter. Means if your plant growth or biomass growth is high above ground, then your soil will have more organic matter. In climate zones where the natural vegetation includes both forest and grassland, the soil organic matter is higher in soil developed under grassland than under forest. So in general, grasslands will have more organic matter than forest soil. Now, effect of texture and drainage. We have seen uh, the sandy soils and we have seen clay soil. Clay soil have more water. So within a local landscape, or within a local uh, identical condition, soil texture and drainage are responsible for differences in soil organic matter. Under aerobic conditions, soils high in clay and silt are generally richer in organic matter than nearby sandy soils. This is statement we already discussed. The finer textured soils accumulate more organic matter than sandy soils or coarse textured soils. Here is the answer. Due to production of more plant biomass in clay soil, less aerated. Less aerated means less loss of soil organic matter, and more organic matter is protected from decomposition by being bound to clay surfaces. This humus can bound to clay surfaces in clay soil, but in sandy soil, you have very less proportion of clay. So, therefore, the permanent storage of organic matter in the form of uh, clay humus mixtures, clay humus complexes are there in the soil. So here retention of organic matter is high in clay soil, or you can say the sequestration of carbon is low. In poorly drained soils, you have already seen high moisture promote plant ripe production and relatively low oxygen or even anaerobic condition inhibits, inhibits soil organic matter decrease. You have seen under anaerobic condition. Poorly drained soils, therefore, generally accumulate much higher level of organic matter and nitrogen throughout their profiles than do similar but better irrigated soils. Now you see effect of texture and drainage continues. And here, silt and clay. Silt and clay, they, if you have higher proportion of silt, silt and clay in soil, 
that means you you are getting heavy textures as you are getting fine textures as if you have more proportion of silt and clay that means the the proportion of uh, the proportion of sand will decline so suppose silt and clay starting from 10% 20% 30 or 90% up to 90% 90% silt and clay means you will have 10% of sand 80% silt and clay means you will have 20% of sand so as you increase the silt and clay you can see or organic carbon content it is increasing linearly it is increasing so if you increase the fine textured particles in the soil the organic matter content will increase so as high in silt and clay contain high levels of organic matter inputs and output of organic carbon so this is very simple if you add organic matter into the soil soil will have more organic matter if you do not add if you do not provide organic matter to the soil it will have less so this is kind of management of course it is considered environmental factor but it is actually management the quantity of organic matter in soil is a balance between input and output so losses are so in soil where you add more losses are less then you will have more organic matter in soil where you add less and losses are more you will have less organic matter so main organic carbon inputs are plant roots slough of root cells means certain root cells detach from the roots and they become part of organic matter while they were still live slough of s l o u g h e d slough of means they are cut they are removed they are, they are detached from the um, roots root exudates are the chemicals organic compounds that are released through the roots and stems some stems can also be there in the soil fallen leaves and any other non harvested plant parts and manures and organic materials are applied to the soil the main output means loss is by decomposition and you see it is lost by as carbon dioxide or methane and some is uh, removed through erosion and some is through runoff you, you know runoff when excess rain is there water from the field or farm goes away from the field that is known as runoff so you can see input and output so inputs are plant root this is just somebody by paulson paulson had been a very famous scientist from uk rothamsted research he worked on organic matter now he is retired person so plant roots above ground plant residues all kind of residues can be there and manures so these are the sources of carbon input and dust can also contribute to carbon soil deposited from erosion and dissolved organic matter from incoming water so these are the sources through which the the organic carbon can reach the field and there can be losses decomposition by microbes to co2 or to methane and dissolved organic matter can be lost and soil so these are the output and input. so now you need to have a balance if you have more input less output then accumulation will be more and you can uh, decide yourself this is a balance now impact of management uh, practices of factors so use of organic inorganic nitrogen like phosphorus and potash lead to 8% soil organic carbon and 12% son increase over the control balance fertilizer uh, fertilization and application of organic residue manure increase the soil organic net in general uh, you can remember if you go for adequate fertilization sufficient fertilization and then it increases the organic carbon in soil it has been proved now question to you is when you add adequate and balanced amount of fertilizer why organic carbon or organic matter in soil increase give me quick answer if you apply suppose you are not applying any organic matter to the soil you are using just npk plus micronutrients secondary nutrients means balanced fertilization adequate fertilization you are doing to the soil and crop so why organic carbon increases due to adequate and balanced fertilization just quick answer one minute is left sir due to microbes due to microbes no 
uh, I, I will answer you. So now uh, I request you to uh, start at 12.35. So third and final, final link, I want to take rest of for five, 10 minutes. So I will come back in 10 minutes at 12.35, okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 12.35, you can have tea. So, dear students, welcome back to the class. We continue with the factors affecting soil organic matter levels or content is, uh, of organic matter in soils. The second first factor you have seen, we discussed on uh, uh, environmental factors. There were five environmental factors. If you recall, temperature, moisture, influence of natural vegetation. These are in the environment of the soil. Effect of texture and drainage, and then inputs and output of organic carbon. So after this, we see the management factors or practices that affect the soil organic matter levels or content in the soil. We were discussing, uh, I made a statement that NPK or Balanced fertilization or and adequate fertilization uh, results in improvement in soil organic matter. Answer is because balanced fertilization will result in better plant growth, more plant biomass, more root biomass. Therefore, uh, the organic matter will increase in such soils. And also, if your biomass, plant biomass is more, uh, leafy growth is more, or your uh, shoot part is growing good and root growth is also good because of balanced fertilization, then root exudates uh, will release carbon into the soil. So more carbon will be released. Therefore, uh, you will get more carbon. So impact of uh, management practices also include, besides fertilizer or nutrient management, your crop rotations, inclusion of legumes in the rotation, green manuring, intercropping of legumes, they all increase the soil organic matter levels. If you go for just monoculture of cereals, then compared to these rotations, the, there will be less carbon in monoculture of cereals like maize wheat. Reduced soil erosion increases soil organic matter levels. By following crop rotations, uh, like including legumes, green manures, your soil erosion losses can be minimized compared to monoculture. Now we go to the next uh, topic, that is factors affecting rates of residual decomposition. Just now we have seen factors that affect the carbon content or organic matter content in the soil. Now we see rate of decomposition. Under certain conditions, there may be fast rate of decomposition. Under certain conditions, there may be slow rate of freshly added organic matter into the soil. So what are those factors we will discuss? Let us see what is decomposition. So decomposition means it is a biological process that includes physical breakdown. We have already studied physical breakdown and then biochemical transformation of dead or complex organic molecules into simpler organic and inorganic molecules. That is known as decomposition of crop residues or organic matter. And uh, as you have already seen that mineralization and humification both happen together during the decomposition of organic matter. So carbon and nutrients are transformed to carbon dioxide, NP and sulfur in mineralization. You can say nitrogen mineralization or organic matter mineralization or carbon mineralization. Carbon mineralization is tightly coupled to the release of minerals like nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, and can be driven by microbial requirement for carbon and nutrients. Already, uh, I have told you that these microbes are not doing decomposition for charity. They are doing it for their own purpose. They want nutrients, they want carbon, they want energy. Therefore, they release enzyme or decompose the organic matter or mineralize it. And you can see steps in decomposition. Steps in decomposition, you can see 
uh, fragmentation. Fragmentation is done by arthropods or some uh, bigger organism in soil, like your termites. Termites can make fragments and uh, certain arthropods, and there are some uh, um, microbes. Microbes can do this fragmentation. And then some of the fragmented part can go immediately for leaching because there may be some carbon and then catabolism can happen, then humification and finally mineralization. So these are the important steps in decomposition, fragmentation, leaching, uh, catabolism, humification and mineralization. Now, what are the factors that will affect the decomposition rates of residues? So you see in the list, there are four factors according to Vail and Bradley. Physical factors influencing residue quality means uh, how close the residue is in the soil. What is the composition of residue? And is it on the soil or is it below the soil? Number two, carbon nitrogen ratio of organic materials, microbes and soil, because CN ratio may be there in the organic material that you are adding to the soil. And also what is the CN ratio in microbes as well as CN ratio in soil. All these three CN ratio will affect the residue decomposition. Then influence of soil ecology. So it will be there which will affect the residue decomposition rates. Now I want to know from you, what is soil ecology? What is soil ecology? Hello? Sir, microflora and microfauna that is present in soil. Good. Means soil ecology means it is mainly related to study of the soil organism, macroorganism, microorganism, or you can call them macrofauna, microfauna, whatever you call, flora, macroflora, mesoflora, micro. So all these organisms are part of the soil ecology. Influence of lignin and polyphenol content. This it is actually composition of residues. So now you can see these factors, how they affect. Now, physical factors influencing residue quality. Where you keep your residue in the soil. Surface placement of plant residue result in slower and more variable rate of decomposition. If you put them on the surface, they will not get moisture. They will not get sufficient microbial activity because microbes are there in the soil. So better to incorporate them. If you mix them in soil, it may get some moisture and it may, get, it may be quickly attacked by the microbes. So surface residues are subject to rapid drying also. Their moisture content will diminish as well as extremes of temperature. So if you incorporate residue into the soil, rate of decomposition is more. If you keep them on the surface, then rate of decomposition is slow. Another situation can be when you place these residues too deep in soil. If you take them into very deep soil layers, then there will not be oxygen, so decomposition rate will be slow. So you can see here, here also, there may be three situations. First situation that you just place the residue on the surface. In second situation, you do the green manuring and uh, just incorporate it into the soil and do the sowing of the next crop. Third situation may be you do green manuring into the soil and then you put the water into the soil. So in the third case, in the third case, you will get faster decomposition of organic matter. Now, the location of residue in or on the soil is a physical factor that has a critical impact on decomposition rates. Nutrients mineralized from surface applied residues are susceptible to loss in runoff or by volatilization. Another, another example, though the rate of decomposition will be slow, if you put the residues on the surface, secondly, whatever res residues are decomposed and mineralized, the nutrients will wash away with the runoff. And some can be volatilized because they are on the surface. Particularly if ammonium is there on the surface, then it will be volatilized. Surface residues are physically out of reach for most soil microbes or organisms. So decomposition rates are slow. 
incorporated residues decompose quickly as they are in intimate or close contact with the soil moisture and organism. Second important part aspect is besides placement of residue, the smaller residue particle. If you have more small residue particles, then the decomposition is faster than the bigger particles. If you have, suppose maize is there, and if you cut it into pieces and then mix in the soil, then decomposition will be faster. Instead, if you take the whole, uh, whole stem and, and, and whole biomass or without cutting this uh, maize, and then you try to mix it in, into the soil, decomposition rate will be slow because here the surface area of residue will increase if you cut it into pieces. Root residue decompose more slowly than above ground residues. So this is quality of the residue. Now, next is CN ratio that affects the rate of re residue decomposition. CN ratio of materials that you are adding, microbes that are in soil, and of course, overall CN ratio of the soil. So CN ratio in organic residues applied to soil is important for two reasons. CN ratio of the residues. Uh, I think you understand CN ratio of the residues. Intense competition among microbes for available soil nitrogen occurs when residues having a high CN ratio are added to the soil. Means if your residues have very high CN ratio, like cereal residues, rice, wheat, jar, bajra residues, they have very wide CN ratio compared to legumes. So if you add such kind of ratios, then microbes will compete with the crop plant to take up the mineral nitrogen. Nitrogen which is available in the soil will be taken up by the microbes. More nitrogen will be taken up by microbes and the crop may face your deficiency of nitrogen. So many times after harvest of sorghum, after harvest of sorghum, if you take up uh, another crop like wheat or some other crop, then this crop will have nitrogen deficiencies because sorghum residues are difficult to decompose and and then a um, lot of nitrogen is consumed by the microbes. So therefore succeeding crop can face nitrogen deficiency. Number two, the residue CN ratio has determined the rate of decay and rate at which nitrogen is made available. Narrow the CN ratio, faster is the decomposition. For example, if you add, add legume materials, so legume material may contain 2.5% nitrogen. And you can work out the CN ratio, that means it is narrow. It may be less than 25, 24, then decomposition will be very fast. If CN ratio is more than 24, 25, then, CN, then the decomposition will be slower. So CN ratio of the soils, you can see, CN ratio in uh, organic matter of arable surface, or surface horizons is, means arable soils, average CN ratio of soils is 8 is to 1 to 15 is to 1. And take the average, median is 12 is to 1. So 12 is to 1 approximately is the CN ratio of soils. Ratio is lower for subsoils. If you go to the subsoil, this ratio may be lower means carbon content will decrease than surface layer. In a given climatic region, little variation occurs in CN ratio for similarly managed soils. In more severely leached, if leaching is there, leached and acidic air horizons in humid regions, the CN ratio is wide, that is 12 is to 1, because in those cases, there can be leaching of carbon also. And forest O horizon, it is very uh, wide, 30, 30 to 40 is to 1. So these are the typical CN ratio under different conditions. Now you see CN ratio of soil microbes. You have seen CN ratio of uh, crop residues, CN ratio of soils, and now CN ratio of microbes. The CN ratio of soil microbes is less variable than in plant tissues, but also much lower ordinary, ordinarily falling between 5 is to 1 to 10 is to 1. This is the range. Among microbes, bacteria are richer in protein than fungi and consequently have lower CN ratio. So this is a quiz question uh, that bacteria have narrow CN ratio than fungi. Narrow CN ratio means compared to uh, fungi, bacteria have more nitrogen percentage. 
or more protein. So like bacteria, 50% carbon. So nitrogen is 10%. Therefore, CN ratio is 5. And actinomyces, nematodes, they have 50% carbon and 8.5% nitrogen. So here you can see actinomyces have less nitrogen than bacteria. Therefore, their CN ratio is more, 6. Fungi have 50% carbon and 5% nitrogen, and their CN ratio is 10. So you can see CN ratio of bacteria is just 5, means low, narrow. And CN ratio of fungi is 10. That means it has 10 part carbon and 1 part nitrogen. So this is wider than the bacteria. CN ratio in plant residues is 8 is, eight is to 1 to 30 is to 1. In legumes, it, it varies with the percentage of nitrogen. And young green leaves to more than 500 is to 1 in sawdust. Sawdust, you know, when you cut the tree and in the, in the factories, you get the powder. Powder of the wood is your sawdust and charged materials. They have very, very wide CN ratio. So if you have 500 is to 1 CN ratio material, if you add it into the soil in large quantities, then whatever nitrogen is there in the soil in available form, in mineral form, will be taken up by microbes, and plant growth will suffer very severely. But if you add narrow CN ratio material like 8 is to 1, 10 is to 1, decomposition is very fast, and very little carbon nitrogen will be consumed from the soil pool. Therefore, the nitrogen availability will increase. As plants mature, the proportion of protein in their tissues decline, while the proportion of lignin and cellulose and carbon nitrogen ratio increase, means it will become wider. So younger plants have narrow CN ratio than the matured plant. The meaning is because percentage of nitrogen is more in young stage compared to the older stage. Uh, besides carbon, organism must get nitrogen uh, nitrogen to synthesize nitrogen containing compounds such as amino acids, enzymes, and DNA. Soil microbes must incorporate into their cells eight parts of carbon for every one part of nitrogen. So they also consume a lot of nitrogen, these microbes, but they give it back. So one third of carbon metabolized, metabolized by microbes is incorporated into their cells. Means whatever they decompose, out of that one third they take themselves. So one third of carbon metabolized by microbes or broken down by microbes is incorporated into their cells. The remainder is respired as sewer. The microbes need to find about one gram of nitrogen for every 24 gram of carbon in their food. So in, in this case, you can see whatever carbon they uh, break down, uh, most is remaining in their cell. They make part of their body and remaining they respire as carbon dioxide. Thus, if CN ratio of residue exceeds 25 is to 1, the soil microbes will have to scavenge the soil solution to obtain enough nitrogen. So 25 is to 1 is, is the situation. If you have 25 is to 1 or more, then immobilization of nitrogen will happen. If you have less than this, the mineralization will proceed. Thus, the incorporation of high CN residues will deplete the soil supply of soluble nitrogen, causing plant to suffer nitrogen deficiency. Decay can delay if sufficient nitrogen to support microbes is not present in organic matter or available in the soil. Now, you see, this is very interesting table and it's interesting slide. When CN ratio is high, high here it is considered as 25 is to 1. For example, in rice, isra, it is more than this. The nitrogen in organic material is not enough to support decomposing microbes. So they need external support. Microbes will use nitrogen from surrounding soil to meet their needs. Another case may be that you are adding the organic material of narrow CN ratio, say less than 20 is to 1, case of legume. So here, enough nitrogen is in the organic material to support decomposing organisms. So they do not need upon soil nitrogen. Nitrogen from organic material can be released into soil and be available for growing rice plants.
Now see this data from Will and Brady. Left side is the picture and right side is the explanation. So rates of decomposition residues, decomposition of residues from a legume and a grass cereal rye and 50 is 50 mixture of the two. Now you can see on the X axis in this picture, time after placing residue on the soil surface. So in this case, your crops are growing. One crop is pure crop. That is your uh, cereal rye, this orange color. Orange color is for the cereal rye. It is a cereal plant, rye, cereal rye. And the uh, other is 50% veg and 50% rye. This dotted line, red dotted line is indicating the cropping system mixture, mixture rye plus veg. Rye plus veg, they are grown together, legume and cereal mixture for red dotted line. And for green, it is 100% veg. So veg is a legume. So you see the green one line indicating legume, the red indicating the mixture, mixture of two, and the orange line indicating the rye sown, pure crop. On, on uh, y-axis, you have mass remaining. What percentage of uh, mass, biomass is remained after decomposition. So you can see as with the passage of time, passage of time, the decomposition rate of this green, which is very fast and mass remaining. For example, at 105 days, 105 days, about 30% is left. 70% has been decomposed. See the case of red dotted line mixture. At 105 days, you can see uh, it is about more than 40%. 40% is remaining. That means only 60% is digested or decomposed. See, if it is just a cereal, just a rye, then at 105 days, uh, about, uh, say, 70% is left, and only 30% is decomposed. So here, it is showing that for cereal crop alone, the decomposition rate is slower if you have cereal residue. If you have um, a mixture of residues, then the decomposition is intermediate. And if you have just legume residues, then the decomposition is very fast. So the lower the initial CN ratio of the residues, the more rapid the initial decomposition process shown as the difference. Try to understand this uh, graph. And one more graph is there. Addition of high CN ratio organic matter that is more than 25. So here, more than 25 uh, CN ratio residues are added. Microbes take soluble nitrogen from the soil, and there will be nitrate depression period, uh, competition between higher plants and the microbes for the available nitrogen in the soil. In both cases, high or low CN ratio, soluble nitrogen in the soil ultimately increases from its original level. Now you try to understand these two pictures. First is on the top and other is on the bottom. So you see the first picture on the top. Here, what is happening? Residue with high CN ratio is added into the soil. And on x-axis, x-axis you have time. And y-axis, you have the levels. So here on the left side of the picture, this is the current level. This is the initial level of the nitrate. Initial level of the nitrate in the soil. This is soluble nitrogen level in the soil. And then you can see the, this is microbial activity. Microbial activity that is measured at as CO2 evolved. So you can see there is sudden increase in microbial activity. Sudden increase in my, microbial activity. And you can also see the soluble nitrogen level. It is depressed. So it is very low levels. That means it has been consumed by the microbes. And then microbial activity is very fast and then it slows down. It decreases continuously after a certain period of time. And as the microbial activity decreases, and you can see the levels of available nitrogen or nitrate, it starts further increasing. So they increase further and this level is higher than the initial level. So in the end, you will get the higher level of nitrogen in the soil, available nitrogen in the soil, but there was a depression period because here immobilization of nitrogen was happening 
and it was immobilized by microbes. But then after their activity ceases or becomes lower, microbes also decompose, they release the up-level nitrogen, and in the end, you get higher, higher levels of uh, uh, nitrogen. See the another case, second case, the lower case, bottom case. Here, residue with low CN ratio means narrow CN ratio, more nitrogen in the residues. And you can see uh, this picture, the x-axis time, and initial levels were same, and very small depression was there. Very small depression was there here. And you can see the microbial activity, sudden increase in microbial activity. It was very sharp increase in microbial. So microbial activity was very fast here compared to the above case. And then it started declining. And in the end, you can see the, uh, the nitrogen levels increased. From the initial level was this, and now you have higher levels. These are relative levels. So you can see if you add narrow CN ratio, the nitrogen increase is more than the wider CN ratio. But in both cases, high or low CN ratio, soluble nitrogen. So soluble nitrogen is taken. So I hope that this picture is clear too. If you have any questions, uh, question on this picture, please ask. It is the time. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Sir, in the case of low CN ratio, the nitrogen should be decreased in no soap, in finally. No, finally nitrogen will increase. Because uh, no, not finally, sir, initially. Initially, nitrogen depression is there, but very, very minor depression is there. For a very brief period, depression is there. You see, you, you, can't, you can ignore it also. You are seeing in the picture this depression. But yes, see, sir, yes. in this case, it has come from some value almost to zero. And you can see it has come to almost zero. And for a long time, for a longer time, but here the time, the time may be very small compared to this period. You see, it started falling here and it has become zero. And then it was very low. And then it came to the original level here. But see in this case, only for very say, few days, if you see few days, it was low but then it is started increasing. And in the end, the yes, because nitrogen here is more compared to wider CN ratio, there the N percent was less. Suppose you add one ton of, uh, one ton of rice residue and it contains about 0.4% nitrogen. So how much nitrogen will be there added? 1000 into 0.4. You calculate, please calculate. 1,000 kg is added and it, it contains 0.4% nitrogen. How much nitrogen is added? 400, sir. No. 1,000 into 0.4 divided by 100. How much it will come? See, one ton is 1,000. 1,000 kg. And it has 0.4% nitrogen. This rice is strong. So, 1,000 into 0.4. 4%. Four, 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 four. four kg. Okay, four kg. It will be in kg, na? Thousand kg. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It will be in kg. Now you have added, added, say, uh, sesbania, sesbania green manure. It contains about 2.5% nitrogen. So 1000 kg and 2.5%. Then how much? 2.5, sir. 2.5, yeah. 1,000 into 2.5 divided by 100. You do the calculation. Sir. How much it is? 25. 25. So you see the difference. If you added same quantity of residue, it was CN ratio was wider in, uh, uh, in uh, rice residue and it was narrow in legume residue. So rice residue could add, quantity was same, but rice residue added 4 kg and this legume residue added 25 kg. So that is why this level is high. That is why they have taken uh, some uh, related, uh, some similar quantity of residues. In one case, residue was wider uh, CN ratio. In another case, residue was CN uh, narrow CN ratio. Is it clear or not? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Now it is clear. Good.
So net mineralization of nitrogen. Now you see net mineralization is there. You will get more clarification. The difference between, you can see the difference between amount of nitrogen mineralized and immobilized is called net mineralization. Amount, what was the total nitrogen mineralized and what was immobilized? The difference of these two is your net mineralization. So for summer soil, uh, we have seen decomposition. The total nitrogen immobilized and total nitrogen mineralized are typically less compared to the aerobic soil. Because here you get fewer microorganisms are present in summer soil. Those present operate at a very low energy level. Net mineralization is usually higher for summer than aerobic soil. So it is interesting. So that is why question, one question is uh, said about rice or water load soil. There is net mineralization in or water load soil. So if you go for uh, rice cultivation and go for flooding, nitrogen availability increases because of flooding. You can remember this. Nitrogen availability in rice increases because of flooding. You, you may not add nitrogen, but it will make available nitrogen from its reserve, carbon reserve or organic matter reserves. So net mineralization is there in paddy soils. Net mineralization is usually higher for summer than aerobic soils. Following decomposition, there is a typically more nitrogen available for a rice crop in summer soil compared to aerobic soil. That is why rice love to be grown in water. If you grow rice in water, it is not just nitrogen. The availability of phosphorus also increases. Availability of uh, um, iron increases. Availability of uh, molybdenum increases. Many nutrients become more available due to water logging, except zinc, except zinc and uh, copper. Except zinc and copper, all the nutrients availability increases under water load condition or anaerobic conditions. Many times people curse it, but it increases availability of many, many nutrients except zinc and copper. Sir, phosphorus? Phosphorus increases. Phosphorus availability increases upon flooding. Why it increases? Because it flooding neutralizes soil pH. Soil pH will become around seven. So at 7 pH, you get maximum phosphorus ability from 6.5 to 7. If your soil is having 10 pH, pH is 10 or say 9, however, it is not possible to get soils of such a high pH. Similarly, if your soil is having pH as low as 3, just 3 pH, then also if you flood it, you can grow rice in flooded soil because pH from 3 to 10, will come to neutrality. It will become around 6.5 to 7. So under this pH, you get maximum availability of phosphorus. If you decrease the pH, even if you have acid sulfate soils, you put water into it, its pH will rise. So in, in these cases, uh, the, the phosphorus availability is maximum at around 6.5 pH, where you have 50% H2PO4 and 50% HPO4. And if you decrease the pH, it will be H2PO4. If you further decrease the pH, this H2PO4 will fix with aluminum and uh, iron. Aluminum, iron with some other metals. So this uh, phosphorus will become unavailable or less available if you decrease pH beyond 5.5. Below 5.5, this phosphorus will get fixed with some metallic uh, cations. And if you increase the pH beyond 7.5, it will get fixed with calcium. So therefore you get maximum phosphorus ability from 6.5 to 7 pH. I don't know whether it is satisfying you or not. Yes, you, sir. It is there in your mind, if you decrease the soil pH, phosphorus ability increases, that's true. But from seven, uh, if you decrease pH from 5.5 and less, then you will not have any phosphorus ability. It will be fixed with aluminum and uh, some other uh, metals. 
So, and, and you will be happy to know that this, uh, this phenomena was discovered by an Indian scientist. Some Mukherjee was there, who said this aluminum, aluminum increases acidity uh, under, uh, in acidic soils. He made some good research, which was re recognized international as Mukherjee or some. In 1930s or 40s, he discovered this. Aluminum releases hydrogen ions in soil. So key points of CN ratio and decomposition. Microbes responsible for decomposition require nitrogen for their growth. Microbes feeding on organic matter low in nitrogen must get additional nitrogen from soil. That is immobilization happens. And organic matter high in nitrogen may provide more nitrogen than what is needed by decomposing organism. So this is your point. This excess nitrogen becomes available for plants. So these are important points about CN ratio and decomposition. So now influence of soil ecology on residue decomposition. As the name suggests, higher the microbial growth, the faster will be the rate of decomposition. And the factors which affect the microbial growth will affect the residue decomposition. The temperature, the water, the aeration, the, all these factors, the proportion or diversification, all these factors will affect the microbial growth. And these factors will ultimately affect the action of the microbes. So in nature, the process of nitrogen mineralization involves the entire food web, not just the saprophytic bacteria and fungi. The soil management that favors a complex food web with many trophic levels can be expected to enhance the cycling and efficient use of nitrogen and of nutrients. Now, next is fourth factor is influence of lignin and polyphenol content. So higher the concentration of these compounds in the plant, slower is the rate of decomposition of the residues. So the lignin content of plant litter may range from less than two to 50%. Those materials with high lignin content usually decompose very, very slowly. Phenol, um, uh, polyphenol compounds found in plant litter may also inhibit decomposition. Lignin and phenol content also influence the decomposition and release of nitrogen from green manures. Now you can see, uh, uh, I, I will start this topic later because now I have been very slow. I could finish only 38 slides. Now we have 55 slides. So remaining I will complete in the next lecture uh, whenever it is there. And Normally, uh, dear students, you are welcome in this class. We continue with the topic management of soil organic matter. We have already covered factors affecting organic matter content in soil and factors affecting decomposition of organic matter. And uh, I think we were discussing the factors affecting decomposition the rate, rate of decomposition of organic matter. And we started with a uh, factor affecting soil organic matter levels, some general points, two factors, environmental factors and management factors are, affect the soil organic matter levels. And we discussed different environmental factors, temperature, moisture, and vegetation, texture, drainage, and uh, inputs and output of organic carbon, impact of management practices, your all agronomic practices like tillage, the uh, uh, soil fertility maintenance, they all will affect the organic matter. Balanced fertilization and integrated nutrient management practices enhance organic matter in the soil. We started factors affecting rates of residue decomposition. And we have seen number of factors, physical factors, carbon nitrogen ratio of organic materials, microbes and soil, influence of soil ecology, and influence of lignin and polyphenol contents. So we discussed physical factors. We also tried to discuss CN ratio. You see, CN ratio is very, very important. And the students should have proper knowledge of this CN. And for this, tomorrow or today, uh, just I forgot, but I would send you some 
very interesting literature on organic farming. And it will be a, a great deal of literature I will send you. You can use it in later hours. Whenever required, you can use that literature. Uh, CN ratio, we continued. And then uh, influence of soil ecology on organic matter, uh, decomposition rate. I think I completed up to influence of lignin and polyphenol content. Now from here, we start the topic, organic supplements and soil pollution. In the very first or second slide of the last lecture, I started with uh, uh, soil pollution, if you remember. And I also told you that organic matter plays important role in minimizing soil pollution or in reducing the side effect of soil pollution on plant growth. So how organic matter can be useful? In addition to other methods, other approaches to reduce soil pollution or to face the soil pollution, this is one of, one of the important methods. Soil organic matter. So it is quite complicated role of soil organic matter, you can see here, but you just see the boxes, yellow boxes. What the soil organic matter is doing, it is helping in the water retention, aeration, proper aeration of the soil, aggregation of the particle. Aeration happens because of aggregation of the particle. So what this soil organic matter is doing, once it is in the form of uh, uh, humus, then it binds with the clay particles and it makes the clay humus complex. Therefore, binding of uh, particles is encouraged by humus. And once you have aggregation of the particles, then aeration is improved. And not just aeration, this aggregation, or you see, it, it means the soil structure is improved. If you get aggregated part, uh, aggregation of the particles, soil particles, that means your soil structure is improved. And once your soil structure is improved, I can tell you three things you can remember. One is that water relations in the soil improve. Means uh, there will be a good quantity of water, good quantity of air once aggregation is there. And secondly, the root growth will, will increase because of aggregation. And thirdly, the microbial activity will improve due to soil aggregation. So there are three important things, uh, increased root growth, increased aeration, increased water retention, uh, and improved uh, microbial. So because of this, you can uh, see the plants are in advantage. Promotion of plant growth, I've shown you. Humic substances, they promote the plant growth. NPS, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, mineralization, you have seen. Carbon sequestration is there if you go on adding organic matter and compound retention. So overall, you can see these are the important effects of soil organic matter, or you can say direct effect. The yellow box is telling you direct effect. And you can see their interaction, their interrelation. And then you can see the consequences or result, result of improved water retention or aeration or aggregation. So these are causing changes in erosion protection, soil biodiversity improved, primary production increase, climate regulation, water quality. So overall, you can see that there are number of direct benefits of organic matter. Those direct benefits are there in the yellow color boxes and the green color boxes, you know, these are indirect effects of soil organic matter. So you can see number of advantages or merits are there if uh, uh, this organic matter is given. Now we see organic supplements and soil pollution, it continues and you can see that uh, in the last slide, you have seen that soil organic matter improve some soil properties, physical, chemical, and biological. If we just see example, uh, chemical properties like cation exchange capacity. Cation exchange capacity, if cation exchange capacity uh, is increased because this organic matter or humus will increase the cation exchange capacity. And then you got aluminum toxicity. It can also be reduced by humus. Allelopathic effects can be uh, reduced and heavy metal toxic, so toxicity will be reduced. So this cation exchange capsule, aluminum toxicity, allelopathy, heavy metal toxicity, these are influenced 
or influenced by organic matter and they help in reducing the soil pollution. So these are related to soil pollution. Therefore, organic matter helps in uh, solving uh, some of the issues related to soil pollution. Increasing organic matter in soil increases the cut. Now in detail, cation exchange capacity. Okay. Or, or that means uh, if cation exchange capacity is increased, then it can absorb certain heavy metals. It can absorb pesticide. So ultimately, the the effect of pollutants will be less on the plant. At same pH, plants from soil high in organic matter do not exhibit the symptoms of aluminum toxicity. This is advantage. Means this aluminum uh, toxicity happens in low pH soil. But if you add organic matter, if you increase organic matter, the ill effect of aluminum toxicity are reduced. Aluminum is chelated by organic matter. So this is uh, this is how aluminum toxicity is reduced by organic matter because your humus is a chelating agent. It acts as a chelating agent also. So aluminum is chelated by organic matter or you can say by humus, thus reducing the amount of aluminum in the solution. Then considering allelopathy, how organic matter can be helpful. So adequate levels of soil organic matter neutralize the toxic chemicals produced by plants. So allelochemicals, you know, they are produced by plants and one uh, allelochemicals released by some plants can affect the growth of other plants adversely. So if that is the case uh, of allelopathy, then organic matter can be helpful. So you can see these are uh, some of the interesting fact, uh, how this uh, organic matter is, is uh, uh, putting challenge before the chemical pollution of the soil. Organic matter reduces soil erosion. You have seen uh, why, how it reduces. Eroded soil may contaminate water bodies by pesticides and chemical pollutants. Sources of heavy metals, commercial fertilizer, liming material, agrochemicals, sewage sludge, and other waste, irrigation water, and atmospheric deposit. So you can see heavy metals already discussed. They can come into the soil and they cause pollution. So organic matter is very, very useful in retaining the heavy metals and nutrients which reduce environmental contamination. So here it is important mainly by adsorption of heavy metals and adsorption of nutrients, it is uh, conserving the nutrients. Organic matter constituent uh, carry a negative charge. Overall, it has got a negative charge and has able to adsorb heavy metal. So this is how you are from environmental science, how this uh, organic matter can reduce soil pollution. And not only heavy metals, but this cation exchange can also absorb these uh, colloids, humus. If agricultural lands are having low organic matter, applied herbicides may leach easily and contaminate the surface or groundwater. Adsorption of herbicide on the soil organic matter should decrease its transport in the soil. So therefore, it, pesticides, uh, contamination of ground and surface water can be reduced if you have sufficient organic matter in the soil. Is it understood to both of you, this uh, role of organic matter in uh, preventing or in reducing soil erosion? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Any point, any doubt? No, sir. All right. Organic matter can work as a factor which causes heavy metals release, but is also can immobilize them. Means at the same time, sometimes it can release. So that that is also possible. But most of the time, you see it is advantages. The protective role of soil organic matter for plants lies in high cation exchange caps and the ability to form simple and chelate compounds with heavy metal ions in soil. So this is already covered. High cation exchange capacity, more adsorption of heavy metals, and also it can chelate the heavy metals. That is interesting. Now you see role of organic supplements and soil pollution. 
So this table is about bioaccumulation indexes of lead. Lead is your PB in dry mass of plants. This paper is perhaps from China. I have a copy of this paper. He and some, some Chinese is there. I will send you a copy of this interesting paper. So now you need to know what is bioaccumulation index. This is with respect to heavy metals. So bioaccumulation index is the ratio of a heavy metal content in a plant to its total content in the soil. Means suppose in soil you have 100 units of heavy metals and they have come, come uh, out of 100 units, plant has taken say uh, 30 units plant has taken 30 part of the heavy metals, then this uh, bioaccumulation index will be 0.3. It is like this. <laughs> so what, what concentration is there? Ratio of heavy metal content, which is related to actually concentration, not the whole content. It is related to concentration of heavy metals. It is not that all the heavy metals will come. If concentration of heavy metals was say 100 ppm, it is too high, but suppose 100 ppm, and in the plant it was 30 ppm. That means it is 0.3 is the bioaccumulation index, if I understand it correctly. So bioaccumulation index is ratio of a heavy metal content, that is concentration in a plant to its total concentration in the soil. So you can see on first uh, column, uh, rye, winter wheat, these are different crops. Second column, part of the plant used. They have used a certain in certain parts, they have tested the concentration of the heavy metal, lead. This is only for lead. Now you see control data. What is the concentration of heavy metal lead in different parts of different plants? These are the concentration, uh, sorry, index, PI, a bioaccumulation index, and then see the brown coal. Brown coal is organic material. It, it, is, it contains carbon, a lot of carbon is there. Now, next product is reculta. Reculta, reculta is also kind of brown coal. You can see reculta is soft brown coal from the conine basin deposits a brown coal. So this reculta is a brown coal, but different from this brown coal. Little bit difference is there. So, but it is a coal and then farmyard manures. All these materials were added. Three materials were added to the soil and one was controlled. That means they have not used organic amendments in the control. Now you see uh, some data. See the first data. In rye, lead was tested in roots and without organic amendment, the BI was 0 0.980. But when you add organic matter, like brown coal, so BI reduced 0 0.44, 0 0.43, 0 0.45. So much less than the, than the control. So you see for all the data, any data you can see, see the last line, last row. Uh, facilia, facilia was the plant stock plus leaves. So it was 0 0.29 in control, but in others, it was less than the control. That means uh, the accumulation of heavy metal decreases in plant if you add organic amendments, that is the conclusion. Similarly, you can see for zinc, this is for zinc, same kind of story, same data, same experiment, but you see different. So in roots, it was 1.75 in control, and you can see then it reduced. So in all the cases, the, the concentration of heavy metal in plant tissues reduced. You had more in more concentration in soil, but in plant, it was less concentration and it was much less than the control where you have not applied organic. And this paper particularly has found a reculter as the most efficient. A reculter was the best material which had lower value of lead and zinc and some other heavy metals in plant tissues. So I think you can study yourself the, uh, these tables. So now you have seen that organic matter is playing a variety of roles in improving the soil health, in reducing the pollution. Now, what should be the optimum level of organic matter in soils that give you best crop production, 
that give you best soil health means overall what should be the optimum level of organic matter because i have shown you organic soils which may contain more than 30% organic matter in india our soils contain less than 1% or around 1% organic matter so which is low or high some soil contain say 10% is it high or low that is the question so the soil now we will see what is the ideal level of soil organic matter the soil organic carbon level below which a soil's function is reduced significantly is critical level of soil soil organic carbon now we need to understand first understand critical level of soil organic carbon means it is the level of carbon or level of organic matter below which a soil's function is reduced significantly whatever function soil is performing if any of those function is reduced significantly means sufficient that means that particular level is critical level of carbon the soil organic carbon saturation relates you can call it saturation also relates to the limiting capacity of a soil to accumulate carbon is dependence on the amount of fine particles in soil so soil organic carbon saturation is up to what extent a soil can have soil organic carbon will be decided by size of the particles of the soil if you have more clays that means it can digest or it can have uh, more carbon if you have sand it cannot have more carbon so saturation levels are different for clay soil or soils having more clay than the soils which have sand so you can see here what are the optimum level continues critical concentration of soil organic carbon in relation to bio biomass yield response now this experiment was done at different levels of soil organic carbon or soil organic uh, uh, matter soil organic matter that at what level of soil organic matter you can get high yields so in this case they observed that the grain yield was highest at 20 uh, gram per kg organic matter 20 gram per kg soil organic matter means 20 gram organic matter per kg soil but if you go to 40 60 or 80 gram the yield could not increase so this 2% or 20 gram is the critical level critical level if you bring down if it is less than 2 means from 0 to 20 you can see if it is less than 220 then yield was low the yield was less below 20 so means if you go to 20 here then there is no decrease in yield there is no decrease in soil function so therefore in this case 2% is the critical level of soil organic carbon but you can report it in terms of organic matter also by multiplying it with 1.724 so for example here you can see that how this 20 gram per kg soil is converted into percentage carbon so percentage carbon you can convert 1000 gram soil contain 20 gram because 1 kg soil contain 20 gram or 40 gram or 60 gram so 1 gram will contain 20 by 1000 and therefore 100 gram because you want result in percentage so it comes out to be 2 gram soil organic carbon that means 2% 2% soil so if you have 20 g per kg organic matter or 20 g organic matter per kg soil then if that means it is 2% if you have 40 g then it is 4% if you have 60 g it is 6% if you have 80 g it is 8% now you can convert it in with respect to organic matter content soil organic matter multiply by 1.724 so you get 20 g per kg means 3.45% soil organic matter and so these are simple cal calculations and you can see this very interesting fact uh, the picture here on x axis you have texture and clay percent is increasing as you go towards right side on x axis on y axis is soil organic carbon content 2% 1% 2% 3% so you can see very interesting fact here 
that the critical value, see the lower line, the critical value is lower for chelate. The critical value of carbon is lower for chelate, but it is higher for sand. Means to get the same response, to get the same response from a soil, one is sandy, more sandy, other is clay soil. So you need less organic matter to get the same response as you get with high organic matter content in sand. That is the meaning of this. So critical value is lower in clay and it is higher in sandy soil. And you can see the achievable curve, means what can be achieved in practical sense. So you can see that clay soil can have more organic carbon content than sandy soil. As you move left, you are moving towards sandy soil. If you go right, you are moving toward clay soil. So achievable curve is uh, telling us that clay soil can have very high quantity of um, um, organic carbon than sandy soil. And therefore the saturation curve, this is saturation curve. So you can see the differences. Now this is uh, soil organic carbon and mean cotton yield. Somebody more person, one more person has done in USA, uh, how this reaps 1997. So you can see as you are increasing soil organic carbon uh, content gram per kg, uh, the, the yield is increasing linearly. Yield is increasing linearly up to 1%. 1% carbon they have tested. From 0.4% soil organic carbon up to 1% they have tested and they found linear increase in grain. So that means it affects your yield. Therefore, finally, what are the optimum levels? 2% soil organic carbon. You can see, you can remember also. 2% means at least 2% soil organic carbon, which is 3.45% soil organic matter in the root zone, is critical threshold or critical level, has been suggested for soils of temperate climates. This is for temperate climates. And 1.1%, 1.1%, that is uh, about 1.9 to 2% soil organic matter, in terms of soil organic matter for soils of the tropics, our soils. So our soils should have at least 1.1% soil organic carbon. And if you have this much of carbon, you can get maximum yield from the crops. Then what are the practices to enhance the soil organic matter levels? As I told you that our soils are getting low and low in organic matter levels. So how can we increase them? One option is reduced tillage and adoption of conservation agriculture. In conservation agriculture, you have minimum tillage or reduced tillage. Therefore, uh, you are also adding residues to the crop. You are also adopting rotations. In conservation agriculture, three practices are important. One is minimum tillage or zero tillage. And then surface residues are laid down or mulching, surface mulching. And third one is crop rotations, adoption of changing the crops. So because of all these three, the organic matter levels increases by continuous adoption of or, uh, this conservation agriculture. So is the case with organic farm. If you continue to do organic farming, it will increase organic matter levels in soil. Efficient handling and management of crop residues. So what is happening, farmers are burning residues. Those residues can be directly applied to the soil or they can be recycled uh, to make a compost, compost can be prepared by residues. Regular application of organic amendment is also necessary. If you do not add organic matter into the soil, how come soil will increase its organic matter? So you need to add manures, compost, biosolids, biochar. Adoption of sustainable soil management practices. Sustainable soil management practices include prevention of soil erosion, means erosion should not be applied. Legume crop should be taken, rotation should be used. So emphasis should be given on soil and water conservation. So therefore, sustainable soil management is necessary for increasing the organic matter levels. Adoption of crop rotations is important, include legumes and cover crops. Precision agriculture is another option, including variable rate application of fertilizer. 
whenever feasible adoption of agroforestry you know agroforestry is very important in uh, these days climate changes so this is climate resilient technology because what agroforestry is doing that it can harvest the carbon dioxide from the air or environment and then agroforestry some trees fall their leaves those leaves can be mixed into the soil and they also prevent soil erosion they also have some cooling effect uh, on the environment so number of advantages are there for agroforestry and they can it can increase income on uh, this uh, agroforestry optimize the irrigation practices sometimes uh, you uh, um, apply excess water that can lead to soil erosion this excess irrigation manage the soil to maintain or increase soil crumb structure crumb structure is excellent and single grain structure is very poor when conditions are suitable add suitable uh, uh, commercially available biofertilizer biofertilizers can be applied because you know living matter is also part of uh, soil organic matter reduce the use of pesticide and toxic chemicals they will also help in improving organic matter content because if you reduce the use of pesticide and toxic chemicals then your soil biology will improve the organism in soil which were unhappy due to toxic materials now will become happy if you add um, organic matter therefore it will uh, add increase the organic matter keep soil ph at around neutral and balance soil cation so this will all will improve the soil organic matter content so therefore this finishes uh, the lecture today and if you have any question anything in your mind